uh, you will notice that uh, the this series has now begun to be called the R Kernel Transport Series. This time we have Narin Kumar, who is being a researcher at uh, OpenOP, uh, a person who spent a bit of time talking about that, again in areas of energy and energy efficiency. I requested him to come to this, come, come, come in here and have a chat with us because uh, I realized that the kind of work that he's doing is pretty extensive and reaching out to India 2030 and her needs. Now, the document that he did called Transforming the Energy Scenario for India 2030 is pretty complex. The challenge with it is that you and I, if we are students of architecture or of engineering or we are managers in places as some of you are, or you're researching for your postmasters or your master's uh, program, you will find it extremely difficult to understand some of these nuances if it's not put in perspective where it is simple, direct, and solutions oriented. We have got also here Padu Padmanabhan, a doyen of uh, the energy sector. He's been in this sector for about 45 years, nearly uh, half a century. Started in 1972, and his dissertation at that point in time in uh, the Indian Institute of Science was on energy efficiency in the industrial sector. Now, over time, he spent nearly two, uh, two decades uh, with the World Bank and then later with uh, USAID, and now has been a strategy advisor at rather few regions in the world. I requested Padu, who is also a dear friend, to come in to see how he will provide a sanity check on what Narin has to offer us as very specific solutions. We have today, therefore, well, this is a slide I will leave for you all to read. It's essentially for you to understand that Eco Close, Eco R comes from the Responsibilities Foundation, which is part of the larger umbrella called the All Tech Company or the All Tech Foundation. Now, uh, maybe you would want to visit alltechhub.org, uh, which will give you an idea of the eco streams of thinking and action that uh, the foundation has been driving and directing in recent uh, months and years. Uh, this is a request. Many of you who have been uh, faithful to know about this. You see that column on the chat box uh, on, on the left uh, for, the, for the chat. Um, if you want to say anything at any point in time, even if you want to stop Narin and say, look, you are obtuse. I don't understand you. You could just put that in there. And uh, we will be watching this and see, to see if uh, Narin can respond. Not at the time that he is actually uh, uh, doing this program, but maybe after that is a few questions, we have a few responses to whatever you would have sought. Remember, this is a program for you all, and many of you, as our profiles suggest to us, are under 35. You're all aspiring professionals. You're all on an action mode. You're seeking to see if you can further your own career opportunities with what you can learn from these eco hour chats. So this time, over to Narin and to Padu. But before Narin starts, I'd like to see if Padu can add a few same um, suggestions on how this chat should be taken and how it can become useful for you all. Padu. Thank you, Mr. Chandrasekhar and Haryana, for a very kind introduction. I appreciate it. And good morning to all of you listening in. As Hari mentioned, uh, this webinar is planned discuss and explore the potential and scope and opportunities of transforming the energy efficiency transition in India. And before that, I would probably take five to seven minutes to provide a brief preamble on the subject of energy efficiency that hopefully will set the stage for that and talk on transforming the energy policy context of the country. It is important in the beginning, to clearly understand the meaning and relevance of energy efficiency in today's fast developing India, where lack of energy could be a constraint to growth. You have possibly heard the idiom, energy saved is energy produced, and more recently, the phrase energy efficiency is the first view. What does it mean in India? And more importantly, what does it mean 
to young entrepreneurs who want to look at energy efficiency as a business opportunity. Energy efficiency is like finding money on the ground. It is for you to pick up and put into your pocket. In some cases, it is quite easy. The effort one needs to employ is low cost or no cost. Housekeeping measures or first aid measures are preferred. In other cases, it requires some effort by way of investment or new technology. And in a few cases, it requires a complete remodeling of the system which you are looking at. So to find out what the quick fixes are, or the must-dos are, or the transformative technologies are, one needs to do an energy audit. An energy audit typically covers 80% of total energy consumed in a home. And can, can I stop you there, by the way, and see if that part of it can be taken in two steps of it. On the action that the SO will want to proceed right. from bring, right. uh, as a first way, what if we use a segment like an apartment uh, uh, association or something like that? Thanks. Uh, I, I will not explore that any further, yeah. except in this stage. You said in the U.S. they call it a weatherization approach. Well, this could be a weatherization approach, which is one part of the strategy. It could also be looked at as a phasing approach. Well, the measures that one needs to follow are very many, and I don't want to list them all. But one could, for instance, in the air conditioner, look at sizing an air conditioner. One often thinks, Actually, one can have a smaller air conditioner to, to, to cool part, part of the home. Uh, having thermostat uh, control, having thermostat set high in summer and low in winter, planting trees and shrubs on the home, and so on and so forth, can reduce the energy consumption, including insulation of the walls. Lighting is a major consumer of electricity, and having LEDs in place of incandescent lamps is probably the way to go. But one also needs to understand that it is not just the selection of the lamp or what is known as the efficacy of the lamp, but also the selection of the fixture and the application of the task to the lighting needs. It's a combination of all these three that will give you the highest efficacy. Occupancy sensors are being used increasingly that when one enters a room, the lights come on and when one leaves the room, the lights dim. Opportunities exist with water heaters in improving the quality of the windows, double glazed windows, the five-star appliances, and so on and so forth, including efficient refrigerators, uh, refrigerators which have higher degree of insulation, which have more efficient compressors and operate under higher energy ratings. Also, passive and heating and cooling using solar, uh, using efficient fans uh, and program programmable thermostats connected to energy management system. These are all the kind of measures that one can follow to reduce the energy consumption. To uh, approach, which I would call it a whole home approach. 
let me stop here. Uh, I'm sure uh, the uh, Narain will talk about energy service companies, which will utilize some of these approaches in order to deliver the savings. Some of it will require energy service companies to operate. Some of these will require contractors to, to deliver the savings. Um, and I'm not getting to the energy service company operations. I'll leave it to Narain, but then I'll get back and then clarify issues as they come along. Nothing. Good, good. Uh, setting a context by talking to you about how a home has to do a few things before we even get to NSK. Uh, there is a demand side of satellite and it's faster than actual on energy as well as on water, I suppose, because water is essentially about energy. We talk about pumps too. And then, of course, that's the hot water itself. So, where do you think an escrow comes in? What role can it play for a residential? Sure. Uh, thanks, Sari. Thanks, uh, good, uh, good evening, good morning to everybody on the uh, panel. Uh, and ESCO is an energy services company uh, that designs and executes energy saving solutions. And the difference between a traditional contracting company and an ESCO is that an ESCO comes in and guarantees that with all the energy savings or in ESCO terminology, cost avoidance. What it means is an ESCO comes in and says X amount of energy can be saved. Should there be a shortfall during the contract period? Yes, we will match up the things. And now one form of matching is usually to be in terms of giving back the cash that was not generated in the initial phase. So they could come to an come to an RWA, come to an individual house, and then say your monthly energy bill is let's say 50 lakhs. I'm going to reduce it to 40 lakhs, 45 lakhs. And then they say, okay, it takes three years of payback, and that's where the whole discussion starts. You come to comes up with the bill. But that's at a high level what an escrow is there. I see that. What is an escrow achieved there for, for an apartment? Sure. And at the larger level for the country or for the government or whatever. Sure. Uh, so, uh, as we just uh, briefly mentioned, uh, now let's do a deep dive into that. Typically, let's say, let's take a 100 uh, unit apartment. Uh, we're talking about a monthly bill of, let's say, 5 lakhs and then uh, an annual bill of, let's say, 50 lakhs. Now, an escrow comes in and says, I could do lighting optimization measures in the common area, I could do pumping optimization measures, I could even put a solar and then kind of uh, get into the supply side of things and then there are energy efficient fans, energy efficient air conditioners, etc. So and so there's a bunch of activities that an ESCO could do. Now at the apartment level obviously there is a cost benefit and there is the green quotient associated with it. And more importantly for the government, there are a multitude of uh, benefits. Number one, it's going to reduce, let's say, the state's energy demand and to that extent the energy input. Uh, number two, at the country level, at an aggregate level, again, we're going to be talking about meeting our fiscal deficit targets, providing power for all, all those kinds of stuff. And of course, helping India meet the sustainability targets, be it the Paris Treaty or the other own self uh, <coughs> targeted. We'll, we'll, yeah, so we'll come back on the fiscal deficit and its uh, implications of the funding a little while from now. And let me add to what uh, well Narin has been talking about. If you, I, I make a distinction between the government and the country usually. If I were to talk at the country level, for example, every single unit of power that you consume in your home, a fan running, for instance, for 10 hours is one unit. This actually implies about six to seven extra power that has to be centrally generated in a thermal plant, by and large in this country, because 65, 67 percent of our power continues to come from coal plants. You know the story of how Australia and Indonesia continue to uh, export uh, coal to Indian thermal plants. Now, what this means is that you are going to be destroying forests, you are destroying complex cultures of tribals in those communities in central India where coal is being extracted just now in large scales. And it, it, you know, you, you destroy your forest, you destroy your river, you destroy these three things, you destroy your cities, you destroy your entire natural ecosystem. Now that is where the, a country or the planet suffers, while from the government's point of view, as you said on fiscal deficit and such, what happens is that with every megawatt not generated, they save up to about a million dollars. Now, if, if they can take this to scales where we are talking of about 
400,000 megawatts that have been projected to be, uh, shall we say, generated from thermal or nuclear or even high day banks in the northeast now, then you know the brutality of such public expenditure and the ecological damage that they have caused. Uh, back to you, Narin. Uh, some ways I think is saying that that saving that we can bring to the government and then back of course to the economy or to the ecology of the country is to do with that megawatt. Can you tell us what a megawatt is? You know, sure. Many of us don't understand this as a, as a conceptual reality. Sure. Megawatt is basically negative megawatt. In fact, megawatt itself has an interesting history where as a typo, megawatt was typed as megawatt and somebody caught it and then said nice term to you. So megawatt is the negative megawatt, as we say, the energy avoidance, which translates into an individual end consumer, avoided cost, or at a country level, avoided multiple such things. Right? Now, why is government keen on this whole thing India is doing, and I suppose the case with many of the developing economies, uh, the energy cannot just catch up in terms of just pure generation, in terms of the global story. There have to be so many other different things that we have to do to make the country self-sustainable in terms of its energy demand. Can it be at the end of the day is an ongoing issue, as a result. Right. So that is where the whole story uh, fits in. And uh, right at the country level, even at the uh, international level, there are enough pressures and uh, enough intent uh, to achieve energy efficiency targets. Uh, countries have come together. And ESCO to the government is an important piece in this whole situation. And there is a specific uh, super ESCO called Energy Efficiency Services Limited or EESL that the government has uh, created along with the Ministry of Power. And they have been doing a phenomenal job and literally taken India into the energy efficiency ladder of the international market. So what they have been doing is uh, they have just gone ahead and distributed large scale uh, utility and municipal programs uh, where they replace the street lights, where they uh, import the energy efficiency pumps. Yep, the okay. Pondicherry and there are a lot of uh, such examples. Uh, and they really work? Uh, yes, so you can work at multiple levels. So, for example, somebody was uh, there in Chennai uh, last weekend and he told me Chennai, is as, Chennai in the night is as good as daylight. Right? It's like complete LED replacement. Right? Plus, that is one. Now, we are now getting into the pumping side of things. We are getting into the agricultural pump replacement, uh, which means a farmer is going to consume far less energy compared to what he's doing. You're saying now. there is a quiet act that is going on where this super ESCO called the ESO, is actually working with state governments and yes. parastate institutions to see how they will take on these big energy guzzlers and bring additional. Right, and the next step is going to be a logical extension of this whole thing where they bring in the rest of the ESCOs in the country along with them and start executing those energy efficiency projects. What has begun to uh, sort of, uh, you know, feel the concept of how energy generation and the demand for energy generation will palpably drop over the next, say, three, five years. Yes, that's the, that's the whole aim here. Now, there are, let's say, from the 2005 energy levels, we are talking about between 20, 15, and 30 percent by 2030. And this cannot just happen by generating more energy. It has to be through optimized energy usage, both at the consumer level, at an industrial level, at a municipal level. Uh, it could be commercial buildings, it could be residential buildings, but that is where the whole story is going to begin. Before I get back to the specifics of societal interest, do you want to add something to what you have just now said, especially in the context of fiscal deficits or what the government can gain from this or industry can gain from this? I actually, uh, I think we, 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 are, we are in a situation where there is a gap between demand and supply. A population of 1.2 billion, there are 400 million people yet to have access to electricity who are either unserved or underserved. So energy, any energy saved, in a sense, will be then more gainfully employed for people who don't have access. That, that, that's one, one, one point that we need to bear. The second point that we need to bear is the fact that there are losses in the system. The generation losses, transmission losses, and distribution losses. And then there's the fourth set of losses that we are concerned about, which probably um, dwarfs all the other losses, and that is the end use losses. While generation losses, uh, some of it is avoidable and some of it is unavoidable. Unavoidable is because of the carnage cycle efficiency. 
one can improve generation efficiency and to the extent possible Indian power plant have been doing so. Our transmission losses are also well within international standards. Our distribution losses are high, 25 to 30 percent, and the government is cognizant of it. And there are measures to reduce transmission losses. But the end use losses, which are in the control of the customer, whether it's in industry, in farms, in homes, is something that needs to be addressed. Seem to be that X to the unit that I consume at the final end and the and the, and the unit that is uh, or the units that I consume. That, that's a good question. For every is it four unit, X, is it five X? For every unit that is saved at the consumer end, four to five units are saved at the generation. So you're end. saying therefore PNB losses, debts and uh, you know all those things account for about five X. PNV losses, theft, as well as end use efficiency losses because yeah, of AC, improper AC, uh, AC, DC, low efficiency of uh, heating systems, cooling systems, inefficiencies in the lighting system, and so on and so forth. All of them put together, if they are strung together, then they consume almost five times the energy that is inputted into. Part of this question is this, and I'm telling the special political ground by making this point. Aruna Singh thinks alone, just talk about 2,000, 300, 1,000 points that have been cleared in the West Coast in the last uh, two years, 15 to 16, uh, 20, 20, 20, 20. Now, why would we want to continue to have such exceptionally powerful machines if there are ways that we can bring the power of these power machines to solve that challenge? And that's exactly the, the point. Uh, the era of centralized generation is coming to an end. It's not as though it will vanish tomorrow, but clearly the era of centralized generation is coming to an end. Consumers will also be producers, and they're known as producers, who would both produce as well as consume. Decentralized generation or small-scale generation without transmission and distribution, in other words, you would use the energy where it is degraded and the transmission distribution losses which are now being, uh, being uh, undergone through centralized generation will no longer be there. Absolutely. And also, since the consumer is also a producer, they would ensure that efficiency in production is matched by efficiency in consumption. And that means selection of the right type of end use equipment, efficient yes. lighting and so on and that's the vision uh, that we need to move towards. So, you know, let's take the tone for question and answer your service. Before you actually go to a society and speak to them, what have you spoke about just now? Of how, like Dr. Rota in 1979, we have to become so humans that we produce and we consume and the significance of that is not merely in terms of the energy security that you will achieve in your residential society, but it is also in terms of how you will stop the devastation that is happening in some pristine ecosystems, either in Arunachal Pradesh or in Jharkhand or Chhattisgarh. How do you therefore talk to them of this considerable, painful impact? Uh, we know that happens in other places, while uh, you know you get uh, your payback. The commercial transaction. Sure. So, to me, the pitch to an Aadha Bure that an Aadha should take or the government should take, it's not so much the macroeconomic and the green and the sustainability questions, but of this Aadha just say you have this uh, investment to make, equity, and you have a savings that you're going to get five rupees year over year, and then this is your payback. Done. And so, three years is your payback, five years is your payback. During this time, you know, investment kind of yeah. self pays back, and then after that, it's the actual savings that keeps accruing. So it's basically something like we call it the leaky bucket syndrome, where you fix your leak. Uh, so a leaky bucket, where the volume is more, you it's a, a non-leaky bucket, the volume is less, right? That's how the residential society should be financed. Right? While the macroeconomic pictures, while the sustainability questions are kept in mind, so that there is the emotional pieces involved, so that kind of that gives that extra bit of 20%, 50% more convincing uh, 
uh, from your experience, have you seen them also, uh, you know, sort of understanding the energy security issue itself? How, say, three to five years from now, they're not going to have enough power from the grid to support whatever their needs are. Yeah, so that, that yes, that is where we can bring in this question of uh, peace to the whole thing. Now, yes, we all know that, for example, in a city like Bangalore, which was so rich in like the water resources, water is dwindling today. And then we're talking about the tanker mafias and water mafias. So sometime energy mafia is going to be here to food here. Right? And it could be three years, five years, ten years, twenty years, but it's going to happen. Right? So unless the RWAs, unless the layout becomes kind of at least fifty percent self sustainable. Your candidate from the from the chat that you must have had with a few of these people as part of that research, do you actually see them waking up, listening to what you're talking about? Uh, yes, I would say I would have lied if I told you if that was the case five years back, but over the last three to five years there have been so much with the messaging, communication, awareness, and in terms of okay, the rising cost, the economy building. As part of your research, today. did you enumerate some of these things at the first, at the primary level of your research? Uh, yes. So what's happening is end users are now slowly beginning to say, "I want it." Right? To the extent that five years back there were mandated energy audits and there were enough resistance. Today, at least companies, it could be hotels, it could be. Uh, huge commercial complexes, it could be industries, it could be even municipalities. They say, I want an energy audit done every year. But the transition has not taken from converting the energy audit report into actual energy saving solutions. And probably that is what is going to happen over the yeah, next few years. Actually, conversion, can you tell us how, what that process is between the society or any such bulk consumer? Sure. I call it a bulk consumer because it's a residential society. And of course, the industries. Okay. Uh, so the whole process starts when. Uh, consumers start thinking, is there a way for me to reduce my energy savings? Mm -hmm. And once that awareness is built and there are enough number of avenues, there is uh, this uh, accreditation that our Bureau of Energy Efficiency has done, where they have accredited close to 140 exos at the national level under grade 1 to grade 5. And that is not the uh, just one we list, there are another 150, 200 more exos, and there are other regular contractors as well. So, what uh, the uh, end user has to do is call upon one of these people or two of these people and then get what we call as an energy walkthrough, energy assessment or an energy audit done. And the outcome of the audit is an audit report that says these are the 10 solutions that could be implemented. These are low cost, no cost, these are medium cost, these are high cost in terms of return. And now the discussion starts. And the uh, end user and the ESCO shortlist the solution and they say these are the solutions that I want to implement. The inevitable will be questions of what does it cost me, right. what are the risks. Right. So. If I were to spend this money, who carries the right on this? When do I get to, uh, you know, send my money back or whatever is on yeah. my investment and that? Sure. So at the beginning of the conversation, you said the difference between a traditional contracting company and an ESCO. That is, an ESCO guarantees what we call as the energy cost avoidance. Mm -hmm. There is an additional benefit that an ESCO brings. They even bring in the financing aspect. It could be the ESCO come and say the end user does not have to invest. The ESCO will invest on the end user's benefit or a behalf. Yeah. And then take his payment from the I'll sales. Take a very specific example. We have 300 uh, units in the in an apartment. Yeah. Let's say one kilowatt alone is being uh, you know with the demand of each of those uh, flats being at about five or six kilowatts. Okay. I mean with the regular energy bills, yeah. as Padu said, you know those bills can be as much as say two and a half three thousand rupees a month. Huh. Now this will compound at about 300 kilowatts. So. Huh. At about 70,000 to, let us say 100,000, mm -hmm. we have a cost of about 2.7 to 300 crores. Mm -hmm. Which means to every every flat or every family, we have to be willing to spend 70,000, could be one rupee. Right. In order to see that, some part of that energy is going towards what all our common am amenities and facilities, right. like our lifts and uh, right. street lights and whatever else. While the rest of it could possibly be plugged back into our homes to see that there is uh, energy consumed when there is sunlight. Without having to store it with batteries and such expensive devices. Uh, some of you are listening in. I do not know if I went too fast on that one or if you have connected into what that can mean. If you picture yourself or your dad paying those bills at, at, at every month on, on, the, uh, on the electricity tariff that is, uh, that is generated in your home or uh, the apartment. Let's see what uh, uh, Marin has to offer. Yeah, so let's uh, stick to the same uh, example that you said. Right now, we are talking about let's say a per apartment or a per housing unit cost of let's say about 50,000 to 1 lakh. Right now, what an escrow is going to say is you don't invest this one lakh, I will do this investment on your behalf, and then there's a five year 
contract period during which I take this payment out of the savings. So the one lakh is in terms of these interest terms and EMI. Mm -hmm. Funny thing is, this is like saying Maruti comes and gives a car to you at an EMI option and also says I guarantee the performance of the car. To the extent you don't need the fuel efficiency, you don't need the performance, I will match that. Right. So there's no reason why an energy consumer should say no to some model like that. I, I, uh, I mean, can I can I take a look? If let's say I have to uh, a kitchen with one lakh in order to make my apartment to get what I can get. Yes. Uh, is there a, a yes? So there is a one that we talked about. There is it still or is it at the association? Yes, uh, it could be both. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, say let's say the first is ESCO comes and says I am there. Yes. Second is ESCO brings in a financial institution which takes into third party financing, and then the financial institution enters into a tripartite agreement between the ESCO and the end user, and then. The savings is delivered by the ESCO and the EMI is taken by the bank. Right? And then the contract goes. Okay. Are you saying that end user could be the association or the bank? It could, it, it could be both. It right? Be but both. Uh, right now, I wouldn't say uh, so much yeah. the ESCO is uh, looking at it at an individual unit level because the transaction costs are too huge for Absolutely. what's happening. I think should come in here and tell us about how it can get to be not economic for ESCOs if they're going at the individual home level. Right. Uh, and ESCO is a business, and like every business, they like to keep their transaction costs to the minimum. Also, the ESCO has its own bag of tricks. In some cases, they may invest a little bit of money in order to get a huge return. In some cases, they may go after the no cost, low cost opportunity where they could save money by just plugging the leaks. So that's the ESCO's benefits. Now, if one were to have an ESCO enter into a contract with every individual customer, it would be very difficult for the ESCO to fulfill the tenets of the contract because of the large volumes of the activity involved. So the ESCO would like to, in effect, but have a situation where several of these projects are bundled together. So that they need to just deal with a, one apartment or maybe a couple of apartments rather than each individual flats in the apartment and deliver the savings. Now, in order to establish such a system, there has to be a role for certain players, such as the government, who could regulate this process, or of the energy utility, which provides electricity and would like to have uh, you know some savings in the electric uh, car system because of the supply demand gap that I just mentioned earlier. But let me step back from that and just make a very simple point which I think oftentimes is uh, not realized. The first point is that the energy efficiency measures that we are talking about which ESCOs can bring to the table as well as end users could do it through their own intervention is not insignificant. In fact, the International Energy Agency in 11 countries proved that more energy was saved through energy efficiency than was delivered through conventional systems of coal, oil and hydropower. Yeah. Can I stop yeah. here and ask you one more question? Let's say I am the ESCO officer. I have gone to this apartment and I have spoken to the society and the end user and that one, right? Now, I am in a neighborhood where it has this division in here, let us say, of the utility, the power utility. Is there a way the power utility can come in and say, well, Mr. Association of blah, 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 these are things that I can help you do in order to see that you bring the sort of efficiencies that we talked about in the whole home approach to things. And then, in tandem with the ESCO, they both work to see that this energy user is bringing efficiencies. Absolutely. The, as I said, the role of the utility is very important. The utility can create the necessary platform and the necessary environment. And also, the utility can also be a bulk procurer of equipment and of services. And this is what is known as utility-driven escrow, where you 
including themselves at escort, who then go out and go out the service. Or, alternatively, utilities could go out on a competitive bid and say, and I'm giving a very simple example, and say in this particular area, in this particular part of my uh, distribution system, I want 10 megawatts per part to be paid. Now, at what cost can an ESCO come in and save a megawatt? So you're talking about a target. A I'm talking set. about a target set in a particular area by a utility of, say, 10 megawatts. ESCO bid for the target and say they could do it at the lowest possible cost to build a megawatt. And then, when they're given the contract, the ESCO then goes and works with the various end users, maybe supermarkets, maybe hospitals, maybe schools, and so on, and enter into performance contracts with them, so and then deliver the savings. They take the ownership on saving, and they bid is prized and rewarded on the basis of what they will bring in as megawatts. Uh, what they will bring in as megawatts, which is what the utility is going after, because what does the utility gain? To the extent that they don't have to generate power, they can use it. Sure. Did you talk about such a scenario where the business of the ESCO is to see that it bids on an auction contract or retail contract and secure with revenues and what it will perform on that megawatt scale? In fact, I actually talked to the Tata Power. Uh, Tata Power in Mumbai, for example, I think four years back, came out with one of the first pilot projects of what we call a demand driven auction. Okay. And they were actually putting this bid to ESCO to come in. What it essentially means is the peak demand acts against the average demand, uh, say the layman. Now the peak demand is more important for a utility because at the peak, if you don't, uh, if you don't deliver something, it means that can come out of input, that can come out of energy savings, etc. Energy generation, etc. Right. So what uh, the Tata Power kind of people told was, yes, suppose you come in and I will give you 100 end users to go and talk to where you optimize. To the extent that I tell you at 9 a.m. I want X amount of reduction in my peak demand, you deliver it and give it to me, right? And there is a shared uh, model between the utility, between the end user, and the uh, ESCO coming in here. Right? So that is happening as we talk. Great. That takes us to the last of our questions before Padu wants to. I, I just want to make a brief intervention. Uh, having uh, an ESCO deliver megawatt through a competitive bidding process. It requires a certain directive from regulatory agencies. Now, for instance, in the, in the US, they have the concept of integrated resource planning, wherein if a utility were to submit a proposal to the regulatory commission on setting up of a power plant to generate a certain amount of megawatt to meet a future load, the regulatory commission is well within its powers to ask the utility to look at alternatives to generation by looking at investments in so distribution or end use and provide or, uh, in savings or in savings and provide an alternative plan where the amount of power which is required to be generated can be met through energy saving through end use efficiency. So such an integrated resource planning is then the basis in which decisions are made and the regulator could well ask the utility to go in for a competitive bid for demand side management if it is cheaper than generating through, uh, through, 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 through conventional means. And that's how the whole process of um, engaging ESCOs and so on begins with a utility directive wherein an IRP is the basis, or integrated plan is the basis for the decision making. And we need to include that in the Indian context and if one were to do that, then one would find that the market for ESCOs could then start building up. So in a sense, you have uh, sort of preempted the answer that Narendra possibly want to offer on this last question. Should the residency sector be some priority for ESCOs? Where are, what are other energy segments that ESCOs should be addressing? I think you're saying the key players will be the regulatory authorities or the commission as you said. It would be the discounts or the distribution companies who have to, you know, set some checks and balances and efficiency if possible on transmission, distribution, tariffs and such, including AC and DC losses. DC transmission comes at 3%, AC transmission, you know, comes at 8 to 
that sort of thing. But you're saying we are in a global power when it comes to education and transportation. So the last will of course be savings. So we have got generation on one side, distribution on the other side, savings on the third side. These are the three focal areas. Now, when we talk the residential sector, this question suddenly becomes a little, uh, you know, um, shall we say, uh, needless. Um, but if you just rephrase that question to just understand where is the energy efficiency market today, right? And how are expenses per capita doing? These are the other questions. Mm -hmm. I would say, compared to what an industry or even commercial buildings has done, residential property has not even started anything called energy efficiency. Right? Even though there's a huge potential, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of uh, what, for example, uh, Fatu said, in terms of the entire disaggregated nature of the uh, residential society. Large scale energy efficiency Explain program that was today. Would be disaggregated. Sure. So, what it means is in a commercial building, I'm talking like a, like a two lakh square feet space. When I go to a cement plant, I'm talking like a huge uh, energy demand there. Versus in a residential society, the common area is probably 10 to 20 percent, and 80 percent is our individual units. Right? So, where I have to talk to, where as an ESCO, as a financial institution, as even let's say the utility, where I have to talk to one consumer, here I have to go and talk and convince factors. So that much amount of challenge exists today. So you're saying ESCOs will be therefore business terms be reluctant to do it. Be reluctant as of now until there's a way for utilities to come in, until there is a way for ESL kind of super ESCOs to bundle up the stuff and then go after the local system integrators, local ESCOs, small uh, scale ESCOs to deliver these individual expenses. Can this be done by law, by using the state? Uh, yes. So it has already started happening in the industrial sector and even the commercial sector. Uh, where you are supposed to, for example, maintain certain amount of uh, energy demand, certain amount of what they call in technical terms power quality, and even to the extent in the demand response example that you talked about, deliver and execute some of those, let's say, you have 20% target, 10% target. And possibly that is coming in now, uh, where the government is mulling over some law where residential societies can also be mandated, like the VTP, SCP law, where anything about 20% need a SCP law and then the entire Bangalore Association is fighting over it. Something like that could be in not a distant horizon, probably a short or midterm horizon that's coming. So I go back to you but on what we started with. What are those, I asked you then to see if you can offer a few sample sets to what uh, uh, Naren will uh, want to explain and this process of interaction between the SCO and the home or property you are talking to itself. The other is, I also requested to see if you have some words or some inspiration, which is what we call your ears, to somebody who is 20, 22, 25, even 30, either a fresh graduate wanting to seek a job in the, in the new industry, or someone who is already a working professional wanting to enhance opportunities. Let me take your setting question first. I think the opportunity to deliver energy safe much greater than the opportunity that you get through a renewable energy strategy. And the reason is the following. As I said earlier, there are more energy has been saved than being produced through conventional fuels in many of the industrialized economies. India has passed energy use is going to mount as it is and the opportunity for savings is going to be accompanying the greater energy use. ESCOs in the industrial sector probably might work for the reason that industry as well as hotels and the organized sectors such as hotels and, 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 uh, and hospitals and so on. When it comes to homes, for the reason that Naren very clearly mentioned, that it's a disaggregated sector, it's going to take a while before that particular sector offers a business opportunity. But having said that, in such apartments and in such utilities where the importance of demand side management has now surfaced, the and the regulatory commissions in the state are also aware it is possible to create the ecosystem for supposed to operate in apartments and in homes and so on. The last, and let me end there, is that there is another player 
who could be motivated to participate along with entrepreneurs, and that is the vendors of equipment, uh, whether it's in air conditioning equipment or efficient appliances and so on. And they would certainly like to participate in enlarging their own market and using energy savings as a way to differentiate themselves from the competitors. And entrepreneurs could utilize that fact and work out partnerships with these manufacturers, sales of efficient equipment in homes. Who would be that entrepreneur? What kind of this entrepreneur could be an ESCO, but not in all cases would the ESCO model work for the reasons that we mentioned to begin with. They could be energy efficiency service providers where they provide project management and implementation assistance to uh, to, to end users who don't have the capacity to do it themselves. Actually, you will uh, you will all see that there is a good another opportunity to hear. Let me tell you. Uh, let me remind you, shall we say, of what Narin said sometime through this. How an ESCO steps in and offers to do an audit of the energy transition of whatever that the unit is. And the role that such auditors of the kind that uh, Padu Padmanabh is talking about is going to be significant. The need is going to grow explosively. And if you're a young engineer, look for a placement in such a company or create one. Narin, if I were to, you know, want to wrap this up beyond what we have done as countdown questions, would you want to take a couple of very specific examples of, you know, energy bills that existed before? and after intervention from an ESCO. Sure. So I can give a personal example of uh, mine, where I was working with an ESCO organization. Uh, it was an F&B, a food and beverages industrial client, and their annual energy bill was six crores. And post our intervention, their annual energy bill is four and a half crores. What is the nature of the industry? You don't have to take the name of the industry. Uh, it's, it's a vendor-driven uh, ESCO uh, model uh, that does uh, drives and uh, such kinds of equipment. And what was the additional investment they made? Now yes, uh, so the uh, total investment was for about 5 crores and then the annual energy bill was reduced by 1.5 to 2 crores. So basically they got a 3 years straight payback okay. and the contract was over a 5 year period and now they are getting the benefits of it. So this was a case where I was personally involved. And while it's it quickly, we are now talking about a lot of uh, incentives from, from World Bank assistance schemes, the government of India is assisting. Uh, I know a few personal case studies where there was a hotel that was consuming around 2 crores, and today I think their energy bill is around 1.6 crores, and 40 lakhs is their annual savings, and the investment was less than 1 crore. So and we are talking about it less than how much? Uh, around 2 years. Really? Right? So that's about hotels, hospitals, everything, uh, benefits. Sometimes even well, less than a year of paid back hotel. Right. So if you're an engineer out there, and if this was 1990, you would have simply not conceived of situations of the kind that you've got before us now. And there are a lot of technology-oriented startups uh, just for the young community. For example, there's a startup called Clipex that's working with the government of Kerala, where over the last 12 months, every bill that the Trivandrum city uh, consumers are getting is now going to tell them, with respect to your neighboring with respect to the people in Trivandrum, this is where your benchmark is, right? And this is your lighting load, this is your air conditioning load, these are the other loads, and over the last three months, they have now started saying, one, two, three, these are the solutions that you could be doing, right? And there's another company called Applewood, which is kind of aggregating all the energy consuming uh, meter data, essentially over the cloud, right? Everything is over the cloud, so why not energy? And then they are now reducing the cost in terms of monitoring, where hundreds of units, thousands of units they're gathering, and then sending them monthly reports saying these are the solutions that you could do uh, to improve your energy efficiency. Right? So that's what that's happening. So, and it's a tremendous uh, uh, sector and uh, we, are, we are the technology capital of the world. So let's be the energy technology capital of the world as well. Let me just add, uh, data analytics and energy efficiency now is getting an important part of decision making. Uh, for instance, two companies in the US how they are consuming energy vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors and how they consume energy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the past and how the energy consumption is. It is through this information uh, analytics 
that they provide for the women. A similar system is possible where in India, where one can have benchmarks for women that one can perform in industry, and this could be communicated to end users through the billing system, and that will motivate them to then look out for escrows and entrepreneurs to come and help them. That's the sort of model I think the Kerala enterprise is yes, taken up. So there are, there are two opportunities. One is to deliver the savings through energy efficiency measures. And the other is to really work with the utilities and work with their revenue department and with the, with the building department in Delhi and install such energy information management and efficiency centers. Got it. Last word from you. Uh, sure. So what I would say is, Energy efficiency, gone are the days when people just saying, oh, I don't have the money, why should I do this, etc. Today we have a need, we have a burning need, both in terms of country meeting its demand as well as uh, the growing energy shortage that's happening. So probably if we don't wake up over the next two to three years, we are going to be having a tough fight against it. Great. That's, I think, a, a nice wrap-up. Thank you, Narin, and thank you for this really great job. Well, this is now the... Uh, question R, uh, you uh, can, uh, we will get uh, Narin to see if he can respond to some of these things that have come from you. Uh, I will sign off to say, how do you have me here? And I, you know, I, let me also tell you that uh, this remarkable person here called Padu Padmanaran is going to have another session with us, probably a couple of weeks from now. We will come back to you upon that. Check our calendar that keeps coming up, popping up on your notes. Uh, over the next say, week or two for the time when we will have another twist of a meeting with Padu. Thank you so much. Hope there has been learned.